May the words of my mouth and thoughts of my heart be acceptable before you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Shalom and welcome all to our ongoing classes in the Sefer Bahir. I am, of course, your host, Ariel Bartzadok. You find me online at koshatar.com. Tonight is the 13th Shi'ur in this series. And unlike the previous Shurim, where we have gone uh, letter by letter in the text, in this text, in, in this Shi'ur, I, I don't know, I'm being distracted here. I get these weird humming, buzzing sounds from my cell phone. It's hearing me on the desk, and literally, I don't know what's going on, but it sounds like it's buzzing SOS. <laughs> You know, it's probably a signal from, like, the aliens trying to tell me, don't teach this stuff to the people. And, you know, if you believe that one, I got a, 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 you know, a bridge to sell you in Brooklyn. But anyway, getting back to our business here. I've gone letter by letter in the text. Tonight we're going to skip. Uh, we covered through 55. Tonight we're going to pick up. We're only going to do number 63. And that we're going to use as an introduction to jump all the way to, to, to 92. And we're going to cover 92, 93, 94, 95. And we have a tremendous amount of material to cover, and in my opinion, an extremely important topic. Up until now in the Bahir, we have covered what I call the traditional or classical old school philosophical Kabbalah, meaning the pre Zoharic, certainly pre Lurianic, understandings where in which the original forms of the philosophical understandings developed. Fine, so be it. Sum it up, we were discussing how in the insights of this school of thought, there is what we call a visible and an invisible universe, dimension. We call it the Du Partsufim, the revealed and the concealed, the male and the female. We went into a very rudimentary understanding of what we now and later will call Sefirot. Now, I will tell you that if you look into the earlier development of what we call Sefirot, in the Sefer Yitzirah, which we've discussed in that series, and here in the Bahir. In spite of the fact that the terms used are the same, the concepts which are applied to the terms are very different. In other words, what Sefer Yitzirah calls a, uh, a Sefirah, and what later Zoharic literature, the Arizal and everything, calls Sefirot, even though they're using the same words, their descriptions are very different from one another. And it's important, not only from a scholarly point of view, to recognize the difference in schools and ideas, but from a practical point of view. Because like I told you from the beginning, Bahir is that interesting book which merges together and weds the old practical schools of what we can call secrets of the Torah. We shouldn't even call it Kabbalah and the philosophical, metaphysical system that developed in Spain, which is rightfully called Kabbalah. So, I don't know how many people will agree with me, but I posit to distinguish between the use of the term Sitre Torah and Kabbalah to refer to two completely different sets of teachings. So, for example, that which we can call the practical or, in quote, magical Kabbalah, the Shi'ure Koma schools, the Merkaba schools, the Hechalot schools, that which existed in Quranic literature, Enochian literature, Midrashic literature, and Talmudic literature, all the way up to including maybe the 8th, 9th, even 10th centuries, possibly even including the writings of what we call the Hasi de Ashkenaz in Germany and Europe and France in around the 10th and 11th centuries. Now, all of that is of a 
orientation of a classical, what I call again, the Sitre Torah. And only then did the later philosophical schools come in, which are rightfully called Kabbalah. Everybody today teaches the Kabbalah, and how I'm describing it, and almost no one today teaches the Sitre Torah. No one. Almost no one knows them. Now, in all due respect, please, don't consider me to be some sacred, holy, you know, super rabbi here that I talk to Eliyahu and Abi. The only one I talk to is my son or my dogs. Sometimes even my wife, if she, she's willing to listen. But the books that I learn from, which I share with you, are readily available at any Hebrew bookstore anywhere around the world. Tonight, we have students from England and Mexico and France and Central America, as well as my local yokels here. Well, granted, here in Tennessee, we don't have Hebrew bookstores. But I know beautiful ones in Paris and in London and in Toronto, certainly New York and everywhere else. You can go on to koshertorah.com and you'll see where uh, on my links it says buy Hebrew books here. My friend Rabbi Nisan in New York has got a great selection. Any book that I reference to you, he can probably get for you. So, there you go. In essence, I don't want you to ever take my word for it. We are here pursuing knowledge and enlightenment and scholarship. And if you can learn and read in Hebrew, then by all means, you should see this material for yourselves. Now let's go in. We're literally going to jump into a discussion in the Bahir in section 63. And I'm doing this to introduce to us, like I said, which we're going to jump to section 92. We're going to talk about the secrets of the heart. We're going to talk about the dragons. We're going to talk about the mechanical operations of the universe. And I will share with you right here from the start my outlook based upon my experiences and my meditations, my dreams, my experiences. I believe that our entire universe operates with almost German slash Swiss technological precision based upon principles of what we call natural law, only the smallest fraction of which do we understand with modern science, and that this entire system is literally operated like a machine by operators who are responsible to acting at the behest of let me use the factory term, if you will. The manager, the general manager, or the factory owner. We call that the life force energy or the sentient consciousness of the universe. UK Vavke, we call it God. But again, our understandings of what God is are so primitive, so mythological and fantasaical, that it, 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 it pains me. When I see just how immature people's understandings are, we are now going to go into a little bit of the deeper waters to try to give you the same sources for the insights which I just shared with you now. So in section 63, we open with a question. And the question states, hold on, let me go get my, here it is. My Lipo, what does it mean it's actually your heart? It's based upon a previous discussion. What is the heart? When we're talking about the heart, the lev in Hebrew, what is that? And immediately, the response is, Im ken ben zomo bebehutz ta'imo. If you don't get it, you are as outside as Ben Zoma is. Lev. First, let's understand the response here. Okay? They're in a discussion with the Rebbe here. Who is the Rebbe? 
They don't really say who the Rebbe is. You would say, well, it's Rebbe Nahunia ben Akana, because that is uh, what we said. Not necessarily. It might have been Rabbi Barachia back in uh, section 51, because he's technically the last guy we ever said that people are interacting with. It doesn't matter. Don't get caught up in those little details. Who is talking to who is not the matter. The issue is, the question was, what is the heart? Remember, heart in Hebrew, Lamed Bet, numerical value 32. Essentially, the question is not what is the heart speaking of, uh, uh, Musar, or morals, or ethics, none of that. They're saying, explain to us the secret of the, the number 32 and its mechanical operations. Again, the response from the rabbi is, you don't get it? <laughs> like Ben Zoma, you're out of here. Remember Ben Zoma? Where do we read about Ben Zoma? Oh, that's right, in the, uh, in the Zohar, right? Uh, no! Ben Zoma is the guy who we read about, if you remember back in Masechet Hagiga, with regards to the four who ascended to the part of this. Remember, that's in the second chapter of Masechet Hagiga. Four entered into the part of this. And it says about Ben Zoma was one of them. And what happened to him? It says that he looked around and went nuts. Right? It says that he, he, he cut down the, 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 the samples. What is going on here? Understand what happened. Aside from the philosophical Kabbalah, if you or I, right now, if we're going to take a quest, a visit, to this other parallel dimension that we've been talking about, what would we find there? Think about this. You're in that other dimension. Let's magically forget it. If we go there, whether it's in a meditation or let's say we can actually create a technological device, which they do exist, to get us there. What kind of technological device? Ask Eliyahu Hanabi. He went in one. They called it there a chariot of fire. Ask Ezekiel Hanabi. He saw one. He called it a Merkava. These are actual transportation devices between dimensions. That's why they're there. Don't think of this as some philosophical, non-corporeal, blah, 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 like the philosophers do. All of the philosophy that refers to angels and malachim as being completely non-corporeal is actually Aristilian in origin. When they refer to what's called the Sechel Nivdal, the separated or detached mind or thought. That's a Greek concept. You don't find that in the original older materials here. They interacted with these entities for real. Let's go to them. Let's go into their dimension. However magically we got there, now we're there. What does it describe? Enoch supposedly went there, and what happened to him? They transformed his body from flesh and blood to fire. Whatever the heck that means. Eliyahu goes up. He's also transformed into fire. So rule number one of interdimensional travel is that it requires of us some type of physical transformation, which, good Lord, shouldn't be at all a surprise. If I want to go and buy some really prime real estate on one of the moons of Saturn, Okay, I hear I can get a great deal on a condo up there right now. They're going cheap. The problem is there's no environmental controls. So therefore, I, if I want to live up there, should transform my body into a form which would be an indigenous life form compatible to whatever moon of Saturn I'm moving to. Now, you might say that sounds like science fiction or fantasy or ridiculous, but that's actually a concept that is discussed by Rabbi Pinhas Horowitz in his book called Sefer Habrit, back in the 1790s, how all the entities live on these other planets are indigenous to the nature there. So therefore, you and I want to go there, it would be better if we could somehow shapeshift into a different environmental form. Eliyahu did, Hanoch did, when these guys are going up into the 
part of this? They did. Now, this is the question. When Ben Zoma made his transition, he looked around, and like the good old robot from Lost in Space, he says, does not compute, does not compute. His mind couldn't bridge the gaps between the contradictions of natural laws in two parallel universes, and to use my metaphor, he kind of fell in the gaps in between. He couldn't handle it. So now when the question is asked in the bar here, my Libo, what is the heart? The Rebbe says to him, you're like Benzoma. You don't get it. As if you could read into his words. This is not a philosophical concept that you can talk and discuss about. You have to know it. Experience it. And if you can't and you don't, like Benzoma, you fall. That is the nature of the question and the answer. Now, let's go and answer the question. What is this 63? He says, these are what is concealed. Remember, we always talk about the heart, right? The heart. These are the 32. Remember, Lamed Bet is the numerical value 32. These are what are concealed. And from these are the world created. What the heck does that mean? Oh, well, the Torah begins with the Bet and ends with the Lamed. Lamed Bet is heart. And the world is created with the Torah. And that's what it means. Uh, that's a very lovely little, little story. But remember I was telling you about mechanics, laws of nature, 32. Now, this has always been my personal dilemma. 32 is a significant number. We'll go into all those details in just a minute. Blah, blah, blah. And if we go over, you'll forgive me in time. I'm not sure that this number is literal within the context of things. So I'm going to explain to you why. I think that the number and its applications make sense from our point of view academically, or if you will, philosophically, or from the point of natural laws, we understand it. But I think from what we can call the other parallel dimension, I think that their concept of number and form and structure is radically different. Where in which 32 might not necessarily be a literal number, whereas it could be an archetype or an expression of consciousness. Because in that dimension, everything is consciousness. Everything is mind. And if we conceive, therefore, the number 32, then 32 is the number. If we conceive that the number 184, then it would be 184, 256, or 512, or whatever number. In other words, I think that it's a vessel for the light within it. And rather than look at the vessel, we got to pay attention to the light. And I think that's exactly what the Bahir is doing. So let's continue. What are the 32? The 32 are the paths. The 32 nitivot. Remember, nitiv, we discussed this in Sefiyotzira, is a private path which can only be walked by the one. Okay? The heart is a reference to the 32 paths. Now, it's interesting that in Genesis, the creation story, the name of Elohim, the creator, is written 32 times. I think that's one of the original sources where this number 32 comes from. The fact that it's heart, meaning the essence in the center, I'm sure has significance. The fact that the Torah begins with the Bet and ends with the Lamed, I'm sure again, heart has significance. But now, rather than digress to get into an academic discussion, in the tradition of intuitive experiential Torah, the writer says... Right? Mashal. Mashal. To what can this be compared? A parable. A mashal, maybe we could use kind of like once upon a time. To what can this be compared? For example, whatever. There is a king who is in the innermost of many chambers. The number of such chambers was 32. And to each one there was a path. Should the king then bring everyone into his chamber through these paths? 
you will agree that he should not. Should he reveal his jewels, his tapestries, his hidden and concealed secrets, you will again agree that he should not. What then does he do? He touches his daughter and includes all the baths in her and in her garments. One who wants to go inside should gaze there. Secret of the daughter. He married her to a king and gave her to him as a gift. Because of his love for her, he sometimes calls her my sister, since they're both from one place. Sometimes he calls her his daughter, since she's actually his daughter. And sometimes he calls her my mother. Now, here we're jumping around with all of these different curious metaphors. But now let's understand our story. The king, hidden and concealed within 32 paths. Can anybody go and have access to them? No! But we'll learn more about that in a minute. So he inscribes them on the garments of his daughter. Right? Marries her off to a king. And you want to know the 32 paths? You go to the daughter and study the, uh, her, her, her clothes. What on earth does that mean? Remember our dual universes. Remember what I called the parallel laws of natural law. Parallel realms of physics. Well, the higher concealed ways, we just don't know. Okay? Again, I remember modern physicists saying that the universe could have created itself by natural law. To which I say, you know, it's ridiculous because if you have a, any kind of law that exists, natural law, then that would been a natural law giver. I mean, that's just common sense. And it says a little old man with a beard whose picture's on the Sistine Chapel, but there obviously must be some kind of purpose, consciousness, consciousness and sentience. Whatever we know, whatever we will discover at any level in our human evolutionary travels, there will always be something beyond there will always be something beyond. As such, we are taught here, and we know, our physical universe corresponds to and correlates with a higher parallel universe. And everything here is a reflection of there. Now, you and I might ask, well, gee, if everything here is like it is there, why are things like that there? Well, let's answer it in the same way. Because that universe above ours is a reflection of an even higher universe above it. Okay, why? Well, again, same thing. Because that universe is a reflection of our universe higher than above, that's above it. If you're familiar with later Kabbalah, Asiya, Yitzira, Biria, Atsilut, right? But then go back all, why is it like that in the first place? Well, we can go back into a discussion of the Akudim and the Nikudim and the Birudim. These are discussions that we, we covered all in our Otsrod Hayim series. Again, all these lessons are on, on Kosher Torah and, and, and that Kabbalah series. But it still doesn't answer why. Because there is no answer. That's when we get to a point where in which we call God the great nothing. The aim. But this nothing is not nothing, it's something, because it has purpose, it has consciousness, it has direction, it has motive. And therefore, we can't understand. We've gotten to the point where we must respond, does not compute. So there we are. So ultimately, all we are left with are questions. But that doesn't mean that we are left with nothing. Because like the metaphor says here, we can look to the garments of the daughter. The daughter is a symbol of our physical universe, who is sometimes called a sister, sometimes called a mother. All of these are referring to different levels and grades, if you will, of consciousness that can be achieved through our contemplations of the natural world. Now, with this understanding, the answer is what are the 92? The 92 excuse me, not 92, the 32. The 32 
we will say are the 10 sephirot and the 22 letters of the alphabet, but what does that mean? Didn't we say that there's black fire and white fire? So there are technically 44 letters, and therefore there are 44 letters, and 10 sephirot, then we should have 54, and if there's 54, well, oh, we can go on and on and on, right? Because every sphere has 10 sphere within it, so it's 154. See, we're playing with numbers. But remember, as I said, don't think of numbers in such a rigid finality like we do in this dimensional plane. Think of a number like Pythagoras did, that they are archetypes and symbols of higher and greater abstraction. Because in, the, in that dimension, that is what those numbers really are. They are reflections and not actualities as they are here. And when you, in quotes, study the garments of the daughter, this is what you discover. Now, with that insight, let's move on. Section 92. He also said, doesn't matter who he is, okay? Let's, again, don't worry, we're here into teaching. What is the reason that we place the blue wool in the seat seats, and why are there 32 threads? Okay, now 32 threads. The teal to chelet. Go into the Gemara. The Gemara will say, Why the blue in the thread? Well, the blue is a reflection of the sea, which reflects the sky, which reflects the throne of glory. Yeah, okay, so, so what? Well, go look at the earth. You know what you will see if you see the earth? You will see there is a blue glow around the earth. It's like the, the earth's aura. The earth actually has an aura. Here, I'm going to show you for just a second. All right. For those of you who are here with me live, you'll be able to see this. There's a Shriti that I made that I have on my screen right now. It's available if you want it on koshertor.com in the upper right hand side. You just click on it, the JPEG, save it as, and download it. You'll notice the color of the earth. Now, as you do notice, all right, I'm going to take it off so we don't lose bandwidth here. There we go. Okay, now, if you'll notice in the color of the earth, the earth has a blue hue to it. Is that a coincidence? No, that is the color of the Techelet. What is the Techelet? Well, it's the one string amongst the many, white and the blue, and together they are 32. So again, we're correlating the secret of the 32 to the blue. What is the blue? The blue is what we call life force energy. In Torah, we call it nefesh. In the Oriental tradition, they call it chi. In Europe, they called it the vril. Others called it the ki. Others called it prana. Uh, Reich called it uh, the orgone. It's all the same. It's the true commodity in the universe. And what is it? Life force energy. It's the biocentric gas that makes everything in the universe operate. Our planet, according to Maimonides, the Aristotelian philosopher, our planet Earth is alive, it's conscious, it knows itself, it's self-aware, the whole planet is a living being. The daughter, mother, sister, call it whatever you want. And the secret is in the blue. Now for those of you who don't know, I embrace the Tichelet. Not the Radziner Hasidic Tichelet, which I don't think is the legitimate one, but the other ones, more expensive. And I think it's very, very important. Now, there are a lot of people who say, well, don't wear the blue because we don't have a tradition. You know something? I'm not even willing to discuss it with them. The blue is very important. I think there's an energy in it. Is that energy actual? In other words, can I take it in, 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 under a microscope and see something? Could his Kirillian aura say something? Well, I don't know. I, I have never put it onto a Kirillian aura to tell. 
Tefillin have a very interesting Karelian aura. You can go on the internet and see that. But the Tichelet, remember talking about archetype and from parallel dimensions and stuff? There's something in the blue. It's the symbol of the life force. And when you meditate upon it and gaze upon it, we covered this in my Sefer course as well. I think somehow, somewhere it can open up levels and streams of consciousness. So again, when we go back, why was the blue placed in the tzitzit? Because, as it says here, and why are there 32 strands? Again, we don't get an academic answer. We get another example to what is this like? All right? What is this compared to? So, what do we respond? All right? My Tama, what is the reason for this? Why? And it says, Mashal, Lama Let me give you an example to what this would be compared to. And here we go with another example. What is this like? King had a beautiful garden. And in it were 32 paths. Remember before he had a nice palace with 32, 32, whatever. He placed the watchman over them to show that all these paths belonged to him alone. The king said to him, watch them, walk upon them every day. As long as you walk these paths, you will have peace. So what did the watchman do? He appointed other watchmen as his assistants to watch over them. And he said, if I remain alone on these paths, it's impossible for me, a single watchman, to maintain them all. Besides that, people may say that I am the king. So the watchman therefore placed his assistants over all the paths. These are the 32 paths. You got it, right? You understand that? You should. Who is the watchman? And who are the other watchmen? Don't you dare get philosophical with me. Remember we talked about parallel dimensions? Remember we spoke about higher worlds? We said, using the Lurianic terms, Atsil, Beria, Yitzirah, Asiya. Well, all of a sudden, at the highest level of what we call creation, which separates from the realm of the Creator, as we talked about in the Ultra Time series, there is that middle area between what we call Beria and Yitzira, an overlap, and then we're into the realm and the domain of souls. And we speak of the human soul, the Adamic race. And now the Adamic race is a reflection of God. We make the terrible mistake of thinking that the Adamic race is exclusive to the physical form of Homo sapien here on this planet alone and exclusive in the universe. I will tell you right now that is not true. If there is ever any other planet in the universe, that which makes us what we call the Adamic race, that spark of sentient biocentric consciousness will exist in any and all life forms regardless of whatever form they take. Whether it be indigenous to a moon of Saturn, or Homo sapien on Earth, or anywhere or anything else in any dimension. Adam, what we call the Adamic race, is that grand. And it goes more than that. At the highest realm, the universe as it operates, if you remember I said that it operates more like a machine, that somehow, somewhere, all these universes, everything that we have, are put together according to a purpose. To operate and to fulfill a destiny. What I call the mechanics or the machine of existence was turned on to form a function. And that function will be performed. And the head of the factory, or creation as it will, assigned his workers. So you have the general manager, who's, if you will, over the whole operation. And then you have the sub-managers and workers. These are what we refer to as the different races of messengers or workers, otherwise called angels. The, in quote, watchman is the Adamic race, even though it's referred to here as a, in the singular. We must recognize, as it says in the Torah of the Ari, all souls were included in Adam. That means that Adam is a composite race. 
that Adam originally was a hive mind race. That's the watchman. And that is why Adam is both singular and plural by our definition. Above, there is no plural. There's only the singularity. Oh, and I confess I am even concealing greater secrets than that. You'll have to think about that, though. And apparently, the higher domains of which we spoke are put together in the structure and form for what they are, and lower life forms, for whatever reason, do not, cannot understand them, and therefore would be dangerous for them to be involved with them, and therefore there are safeguards built in the system to keep the children out and away from danger. So to use the Ari's terminology, that is why souls of Asiya are not allowed access to Yetzirah, all the more so to Biria. Those who are of Yetzirah are not allowed access to Biria, all the more so to Atsilut. And even those of Biria are not allowed access to Atsilut, all the more so to the realms of Adam Kadmon. Simply because you couldn't handle it. Case in point, Benzoma. He was in a sense from Asiya to Yetzirah. He couldn't handle what his mind had to integrate. Rabbi Akiva warned about this. He says, when you get up to the gates, don't say waters, waters, right? Water, water, thinking that there is a duality. Remember, we spoke about the two parts of feet throughout this entire book. And in spite of how radically different one might seem from the next, the warning is they are one and the same. And I always give this, believe it or not, as a moral and ethical message, believe it or not, in of all places, marriage counseling. I tell husbands and wives that in spite of however different one may be to one another, don't think that doesn't mean you're soulmates. Because if you were all the same, and everybody was yesing everybody else, no one would learn anything. That's why in the Torah it says, Ezer Kenegdo, you know, a helper against him. So that uh, there's always a little bit of friction there. It's supposed to be there. It's built into the system. Even the Arizal speaks about it. He speaks about the sparks that rise from the grinding of the different vessels and the lights. Close. Libra. Anyway, one of our doggies heard about friction stuff, so she decided to knock on the door. But anyway, this is the secret here of this beautiful garden and why there has to be a watchman. And at each and every level, you have different watchers. Hmm. Did you ever hear of the watchers? That's right. Now you see where we're getting to. You see, every one of them is like a factory worker. Let's use our, that term. It's a, it's a good one. Because each and every one has an operation that they have to perform. Whether that operation is the motion and function of what we would call physical space, or the motion and function of time, or even the mechanical operations of the motion and function of consciousness. You think that these things just happen on their own? We recite in our prayers a very interesting phrase, Hamechadesh the Tuvo Bakul Yom Ma'asebereshit. That God renews every day the work of creation. I use this to help explain what I consider to be a rather silly argument between science and religion. And I'll digress for the moment to explain it to you. We all know that by present understanding of science and observation of the universe, that our age of the universe is billions of years old. We know Rabbi Kaplan translated the works of Rabbi Yitzhak Dimenako to show that back in the 13th century, one of the rabbis also stated that the age of the universe was, you know, 10 to 13 billion years old. We get it. And you have modern religionists, Jewish and Christian alike, even some so-called Kabbalists, who come up with this really, you know, the, the, an insult 
to intelligence response saying, no, God created the world literally 5,774 years ago, and no later. All those billions and billions of years is a lie. But when God did create the world 5,774 years ago, he made it, he created it to look older. And he, created, and he put the bones of the dinosaurs in the ground to make it look like there really were dinosaurs, but they never really were. And everything was made to look old. In my opinion, that argument is such an insult to intelligence that it's, it's not worthy of comment. And I'll explain to you why. Because I respond to that and I say, well, wait a second. How do we know that it was 5,774 years ago that God created the universe and made everything look old. How do we know that God actually didn't create the universe just this morning? And that everything before this morning are just implanted and grained uh, thoughts that God put into us to make us think that we existed prior to this morning. You can't prove it wrong. I got even better. We have now been in this class for over 40 minutes. How do you know that that's for real? How do you know this class didn't start literally in the last 60 seconds? And all the memories that you have of this were God putting it into you and it never really happened. You just think that it did. You want a better one than that? How do you know I just said what I just said? How do you know anything? How does anybody know anything? Maybe literally at every second, God is creating the universe. And nothing existed before that snap. And any time we think it does, it's all in our heads. Like we say, God renews it every day the work of creation. Is creation a wave function that goes from past, present to future? Or is it a particle function which is always renewed at every second? Those are two different realms of reality. Maybe that's the reality of the two parts of of what we've been speaking. Maybe that's a reality we can't handle. So maybe at one level of reality we really are billions of years old, like science says. And from the other reality we are every second being created. If you think about that second concept, it could be rather dangerous. Because literally you can step in between the cracks of those seconds and be lost forever. That's what happened to Benzoma. That's the secret of the Dupart Sufim. A dual level of reality. Well, how then do we get these two to work together? Well, that's what the uh, watch metaphor. They are instructed at whatever levels of being that they are to operate in whatever realm and form that they are to carry out the mechanical functions to make sure the system operates the way it's meant to. That means that these entities might very well be above what we understand as space. Maybe they're non-corporeal. Maybe they're above time. Maybe they're above consciousness. We speak of the messengers or malachim or angels at the Asiatic level, the Yitzhiratic level, the Biriatic level. We speak of different ones that some can look like human beings. Others look radically different. We speak of wheels, opanim. We speak of the animals, the hayot. We speak of the reptilian burning ones, the serapim. Those are only three. There are seven other levels to speak of. Who's who and what's what? Each of them are involved in the mechanical operations of the universe. Again, to digress for a moment. We are taught that when we call the resurrection occurs, when the ultimate fulfillment of our destiny and purpose on earth is accomplished, what happens to us? Well, the Gemara says that we inherit 310 worlds. Right? That's a metaphorical number. And Arya Kaplan discusses this in his writings, and I'll take it from him. Maybe that means we're going to go to the stars. I'll take it one step further. 
Maybe it means that our next form of evolution in life is that we'll be born as a star. And just like in this world we have to learn to nurture and cater and care for one another, those who have proven themselves able and worthy take the next step and they become stars where in which they can then provide, nurture and take care of an entire solar system. And then from there, after billions of years of the life of a star, they will evolve to even a higher life form. You will find that that is the beliefs of some. So there is a mechanical operation. Not only is our planet alive, so is our sun. With conscious, clear intent. Can you talk to the sun? Can you talk to Mother Earth? By all means. I don't know if you're going to get an answer. You can talk to them. It's not considered idolatry unless you are asking something or trying to manipulate their energy from them. But you can ask. These are the 32 paths. What is the reason of the blue? Section 93. Now the watchman said, remember, not the king, the watchman. Perhaps those assistant watchmen will say that the garden belongs to us. He therefore gave them a sign and told them, hey, see this, the sign of the king that indicates that the garden belongs to him. He is the one who made these paths, and they are not mine. This is his seal. Why would that be important? Because entities, even higher entities than us, like us, can make mistakes. The watchmen are not in charge. They're workers. They're messengers. They're angels. They do as they are told. And that's that. But you see hinted here that they could make the mistake that the, in quote, universe or the operations belong to them, that they could do as they wish. And therefore the sign is put there. What is the sign? That there is a life force energy. The teal techelet. As the song says, the kav yarok, which is Yarok is green, but it's kind of like the chelet. It's the symbol of life. Somehow, somewhere, if you were to go into among these entities, they can operate all the forms and function of space and time and consciousness. But the one thing that is above their control is the life force itself. They cannot create it. They cannot destroy it. They can redirect it, what we would call life and death. But they can do no more than that. It's out of their hands. It's the seal of the king. And therefore it keeps them grounded to know that they are not the creators. What is this like? Here we go again. A king and his daughter. Oh, remember them? Talked about them in the uh, last Mishnah from back in uh, 63. Here they are again. The king and his daughter had slaves. They wanted to travel abroad. But the slaves were afraid, being in terror of the king. So he therefore gave him his sign. They were also afraid of the daughter. So she also gave him a sign. And they said, from now on, with these two signs, God will watch you from evil. He will safeguard your souls. There is always a danger of misunderstanding. We read numerous Midrashim of some of these watchers, some of these entities of the lower ranks, who thought that they could thwart the system and circumvent it, I really should say, and make things better than what they were because they felt that the system, the way it was operating, wasn't good. And therefore they said, you know, we can come down to earth. We can intervene. And we can get things back on track. And of course I'm referring to Genesis 6. And the coming to earth of physical, 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 flesh and blood, higher form, homo superior entities. Which were, when they came down here and became victim to Earth's energies became very lustful and desired human women. These are whom we call the fallen angels. 
And I emphasize to you that they were physical, flesh and blood, humanoid types. I didn't make that up. I heard that in the name of Rabbi Aaron Soloveitchik, the old Rosh Hashiva of uh, Brisk and Yeshiva University. Quoted it in the name of a book from uh, a Rabbi Yehuda from the 9th century, which unfortunately I don't have. I read about that in Rabbi Aaron's name in, in a newspaper article in the Forward, in the Forward newspaper many, many years ago in the 1990s. And at the time I was a teacher, a Rebbe in the Brisk Yeshiva in Chicago. And I knew his son, Rabbi Aaron Soloveitchik's son, Rabbi Moshe Soloveitchik, and I asked him, did your father really said that? He says, absolutely, and knew the book. That's good enough verification for me. So I'm not the only one who recognized and knows this. Moving right along, 94. Let's talk about these other domains. Let's talk about the laws and the mechanics and the operations of the universe. So Rabbi Morai sat and expounded. What's the meaning of the verse in 1 Kings 8.27? Behold the heaven, and the heaven of the heaven cannot contain you. Well, what is the difference between the heavens and the heavens of the heavens? Well, we have different levels and domains. And he says, this teaches us that the Holy One, blessed be He, has 72 names. Okay, we've heard of the 72 names before. You know exactly what we're talking about, don't you? You think you do, but no, you don't. You think you're talking about the 72 triads from the three verses in the book of Exodus, right? Bob, hey, Bob, and all the rest. Well, I know many a commentary that might apply that to here. But that's not what we're talking about. As we will see, 72, like I said to you, is one of those numbers which has both subjective and objective meaning. We're going to apply that number to all different kinds of, if you will, formula and, and, and applications. But like I said, understand it in the context of the greater reality, where it is more of an archetype, and therefore not necessarily so definitive in number. So understand it as a symbol, as opposed to anything else. 72 names of God. All of them were placed in the tribes of Israel. So it is thus written in Exodus 28.10, six of their names on one stone, and the names of the other six on the other stone according to their generations. This, of course, is referring to the, the what you call it, the ephod, that along with the breastplate of judgment, the ephod and the urim and the dumim and the chosh and mishpat, when the Kohen Gadol would wear them, would activate something with the ark, and therefore enable a communication with a higher dimensional realm we call talking to God. Now, if you look at all the names that were either on the stones of the breastplate or on the ephod on his shoulders, right? You had the names of the sons of Israel. You didn't have the 72 triad names there. It wasn't connected at all. But yet, the secret is how many tribes? Twelve. Okay? Six and six. Okay? That's how it's broken down, as you will see. So it's also written in Joshua 4 9. He raised up the twelve stones. Just like the first in exec, exec, uh, blah, 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 Exodus 28 to 12. Stones of memorial. So these Joshua 47, it says stones of memorial. What on earth are we talking about? All right? What are these stones that we're talking about? All right? Avne Zikaron. Zikaron. Maybe that's male. Remembrance. Mind. You have all these different correlations and the like. But the point is that these stones had letters etched in them. And when the high priest would go to communicate with God. He had the stones on his shoulders, the stones on his breastplate, and inside the breastplate was something called the Urim and Tumim. We don't know what that is. Some want to say it was a scroll with God's name on it. No, 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 no. It must have been something more than that. I think, you allow me to use my word, something technological. 
but not technological like with wires and a battery uh, to connect to the internet, but something of a technology related to the nature of connection and communication with the dimension that it needed to connect to. Kind of like Elijah's chariot or Ezekiel's chariot. We must remember there are realms and domains of technology, the likes of which now we cannot even possibly imagine. I will refer to these as mind technologies. While it is popular in science to believe that there's no such thing as ESP, telepathy, and all the rest, I believe modern science knows darn well that that's all a bunch of hogwash. I remember watching, I believe, in the second season from Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman, the star. There was a show on the sixth sense and the scientific discoveries therein. It's an it's a, it's a episode that's available on Amazon.com, I think, for two bucks. Go find it. Through the Wormhole, season two, episode on the sixth sense. Learn about the powers of the mind. See for yourselves. This is what they make public. You can only imagine what hasn't been made public. Thousands of years ago, from Mount Sinai, when the watchmen and everything else opened up the paths of the garden and stood there and we received the Torah from the king, somehow, somewhere in the fabric of things, we were given the opportunity to connect. We were given a mind technology. I think that's a proper understanding of what it is we're referring to. And we refer to all these things in numbers of 32, 72, and you'll see 12 and 6, whatever. But what we learn, like in the pseudonym books of Enoch, pseudepigraphal books of Enoch, all of a sudden he's taken up to the heavens and he's shown, this is how this operates, this is how that operates, and everything is... is, is operating according to a system. So much so you've heard the metaphors that there's the chariot that takes the sun and takes it from the east to the west. Now there's no chariot. The sun's not moving. We all know that's symbolic talk. But it is operating according to laws of nature. And the laws of nature aren't just existing in a vacuum. There is, in quote, the lawgivers of the lawgiver and his henchmen, his servants, his mechanical workers, making the operations continue. Understand this as an actuality as opposed to a philosophy. Continuing. These twelve stones, remember we said the Hoshim Mishpat? They make a total of seventy-two. They said that there were 72 letters on the Hoshe Mishpat. That when you add the names of Reuven, Shimon, and all the rest, that there were actually other individual letters carved on each of the stones. And there are books that show all of this as well. And that when the high priest went into a meditative trance, somehow activating some things in his conscious mind, which would reverberate with and interact with the actuality of the Urim and Tumim, which we have no idea what that is, somehow, some way, this would activate some kind of an actual energy which translated dimensional powers, creating nefesh energy to activate in an actuality creating vibrations and movement in the stones causing the individual letters in the stones to light up and it's as if to spell out a message. And that's the way it worked. The communication is clearly telepathic. But at the same time, the answer did not come telepathically into the mind of the Kohen Gadol. It came out through the vibration and lights and possibly sounds of the stones themselves. So, it says here, these 12 stones correspond to the 72, these parallel the 72 names of God. Again, entities of power, of the higher dimensions, higher dimensions, and how they are reflected here in the lower dimensions. 
Remember we said some things are above us. We don't understand them. We can't. Just have to accept them. So, why do they begin with 12? This teaches us that God had 12 directors, each of which has six powers, making 72. Now, what are we talking about here? What are these 72? All right? These are called manhigim. The correct translation here is directors. Don't think of these as just nebulous forces. These are what we can call, for lack of a better term, 12 archangels. Each one is a sentient, conscious, separate entity. And their jobs are to do what they do. You can call them, if you will, the angelic fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel. If you, if, if you want to speak so religiously and symbolically, do that. And each, they said, has the 12 powers, so the six powers under them. And they say, who are, what are they? And they refer to these being the 72 languages. Now, here's the secret. You can go on all the commentaries, and they'll tell you that all of these, in quote, archangels, and all of their sub-angels, 72, this is a reference to the 72, what we call the heavenly Sanhedrin. That each and every nation on earth, what we call the 72 languages, has access to the system. Each in its own spoke of the wheel that takes it to the center. And this is why, and even Kaplan in his commentary, to his credit, quotes Tana de Eliyahu, the one I've quoted a million times from Eliyahu Rabbah, the ninth chapter, where in which it said, in the name of Elijah, the prophet of all people, be it a man or a woman, a Jew or a non-Jew, free or slave, all can receive Ruach HaKodesh, which is the connection here, based upon their actions. So indeed, when American founding documents said all men, including women, are created equal, indeed we are. We might not be equal in station in life, but as souls we all have equal access to the source because we're all connected to the source. That's why kosher Torah can be for everybody. That's why these teachings can be for everybody. Because everybody is part of the great mechanical plan and therefore is part of the great whole. All right, I've seen that. I've gone over in my time here. So we're going to have to pick up on Lesson 95 in our next class. So God be willing, we'll pick up and continue on that. I want to thank you for all joining me tonight. Again, I'm your host, Ariel Bartzadok. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you online at koshatorah.com. God bless. Shalom. Torah.com. God bless. Shalom. Torah.com. God bless. Shalom. Torah.com. God bless Shalom. Torah.com. God bless Shalom. Torah.com. God bless Shalom. Torah.com. God bless Shalom.